The purpose of me doing this documentary is to appreciate the work of Dr. Jeffrey Bulanda and uh, also the challenges, the different challenges he has faced in undertaking the task of lecturing with us. I just want to show other departments what we do in the social work department. And I have this realization that a lot of students applying for the social work department have little knowledge on what the department of social work is all about. And this documentary vividly depicts what we do in the social work department. What students with acceptance from the department of social work should expect from lecturers of the Department of Social Work and also what lecturers of the Department of Social Work expect from students as well. They might be called to serve as a lecturer of the Department of the Social Work. So if we watch this documentary which also vividly depicts the lecturing skills expected of a good lecturer in the Department of Social Work we may be in the position to serve as a good lecturer. Notwithstanding that, my, my thought was in the department to have a documentary that will depict the days or the life of students on campus. The challenges students are faced in the department of social work the, 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 the perfect moment we've spent in the Department of Social Work and also the hurdles we've gone through in the Department of Social Work which I strongly believe is part of this uh, documentary like uh, very unfortunately after this documentary we lost our beloved colleague who took a great part and making this documentary a success, RIP Mary Batubo. And whenever any one of us watch this documentary, Mary Batubo will always linger in our memory. By the way, I've been a part of this technical team, um, I'm helping my big brother, Suleiman Koma, in pursuing his dream, his work to make this documentary a possible um, a reality and um, to push forward what people believe is a great idea. Um, I've met with um, Dr. B a um, few times whilst we were doing this documentary to get together and um, he seems to be a very um, understandable guy, nice. Uh, I think he's one of the most beautiful people I've met that you can easily talk to and understand him. It's understandable, I mean, when this guy talks to you, you know um, there's somebody of knowledge is talking to you. And um, but a few of the shooting that we have done together, close to him, um, he directed us on you and do um so I is our director. He happens to be a very wonderful director. I believe whatever knowledge that he's passing on to us right now, he might have uh, extracted some of them from Dr. B. Um, I, I can say it's not easy to make a documentary as um, um, young men like us because in this country there is no facility, you have to pull resources together. It's really not easy. Um, basically this is just we want to show the world that we can do with the knowledge that we have in us um, and I believe Meanwhile, I don't want us to face a situation we are in we will have to answer different uh, questions from our children like we'll have very intelligent uh, children who want to know your days on campus who like to know what task or what you have impact on campus or who want to know what your profession is all about and i strongly believe that uh, this documentary will serve as a possible answer to that very question so with this i strongly believe that the department of social work has set a pace and also students of the department of social work has also set a pace because this is what i call a true initiative there is an higher percentage of me doing social work in life because of what I have learned from Dr. B and my friends because I think helping people is what I have in me and I think I need to reach out far to help people in this world to realize their dreams just like um, the way Dr. B has helped us realize our dreams I think I'm going to miss Dr. B very much um, with all the whole of me I really I really gonna miss him and I hope wherever you are Dr. B watching this documentary um, we really, really do love you and 
We really miss you. Thanks for everything you shared with us. This what I strongly believe is a true talent because if you can depict what your department is all about in this order in the form of documentary, I strongly believe that other people will have a knowledge on your, 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 your field of study and also this will, will give them hodge so that the Department of Social Work will have more applicants to be accepted as a legal student in the Department of Social Work. So with this, I therefore thank all those who contribute greatly to make this documentary a success. That was like one of the best things that happened to us this year. But Jeff is a very nice lecturer. He is one of a kind. Dr. Bulanda is a very, very, very remarkable scholar. I call him a scholar because um, he is so dedicated in his job. He met with all the students in first year, second year, and third year in social work. Dr. Jeffrey Bulanda came to Sierra Leone as a visiting Fulbright scholar in the United States. He is a professor of social work at the Aurora University. Prior to becoming a professor, Dr. Bulanda has worked in many different social work settings, including as a school social worker, as a supervisor of a community counseling program, as a parent educator, and as a caseworker for adults with severe mental illness. The purpose of me coming to Sierra Leone was I'm here as a Fulbright Scholar from the U.S., which is basically an exchange program where different academics go to different countries in the world. And um, it was kind of by chance that I ended up in Sierra Leone. So He has a strong interest in international social work and has volunteered in India, Jamaica, Ghana, Uganda, Botswana, and South Africa. He has committed his career to giving everyone, no matter their social class, race, gender, or disability, the opportunity to reach their potential. I knew I wanted to be in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and so I was writing to different universities um, in Ghana, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and then my first response was actually from um, a former Fulbright scholar who had come to Sierra Leone and he connected me with the Peace and Conflict Studies Department at Fourier Bay College. So I was actually going to be teaching with them, but then in the process I came across a news article where I found out that uh, the Department of Social Work had just started here. So that excited me to be a part of a new department and um, getting the profession of social work here in Sierra Leone. I'm in contact with Dr. Bielander through the phone. A call from the United States that he's, uh, he wants to do his Fulbright uh, uh, service here at the University of Sierra Leone. Uh, and I said, I said, that's fine. I said, we have a social work department. And I wrote the, the letter of recommendation for him to the Fulbright uh, institution in the United States. 
and we back and forth we were communicating with each other until he arrived here in Sunday and started conducting his research and teaching in the Department of Social Work. So I then was able to get in touch with Dr. Jarrett, who's the head of the department. He wrote me a letter of invitation. So the, in my application, I had stated that I wanted to um, teach three classes each semester, um, which I have done um, in, in a variety of um, areas of social work. And then um, as part of my research agenda, I wanted to study the mental health needs of university students in Sierra Leone, as well as kind of look at their educational trajectory, especially since many of them um, during their primary school years, their primary school years were interrupted by the rebel war. And then finally, I wanted to do some service projects while I was here, including developing a youth program, um, as well as volunteering and providing teacher training to local primary and secondary schools in Sierra Leone. Recognizing that some students were not fully capacitated to write standard papers, he started giving out assignments based on the field and then created an office hour meeting as a yardstick wherein he can monitor and discuss with students on the progress of their write-ups. Hi, Suleiman. Yeah, You're here for office hours? Yeah. yeah okay. So. Um, why don't you pull up a seat? Okay. No problem. All right. So we're going to go over your paper. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you had written about domestic violence for your yeah. care planning paper. Yeah. You know, what I really liked about your paper is that you came up with a real creative program, a real creative solution to the problem um, versus just doing a very standard, um, basic um, program. Some areas that I think that you could work on are really looking at the structure of your paper. You know, because you want to have a strong introduction that starts off with something that catches the reader's attention, either with statistics, a quote, a short story. That's it. And then after that, you're going to have your thesis statement, which just lays out, it's a roadmap to the rest of your paper. You know, saying that this paper will address this, this, and this. You know, the prevalence of domestic violence, the um, previous attempts to address the problem, and the program. Okay? Um, then, you know, I would say, like, as you're, um, as you're writing the paper, you want to make sure that you have strong topic sentences for each of the um, different areas, uh, or each of the different paragraphs that really um, introduces what this entire, par what was the purpose of this paragraph, and make sure that all of the sentences under the topic sentence are directly related to that. They support that. Um, so those are my main bits of feedback. Do you have any... Other questions? I think I'm here just for you to show me my loopholes, my waiting points on this paper so I can redo it and then uh, it will be standard. Mm -hmm. It will be the standard work, that's all, nothing else. So I'm going to do it now and then I'll check on you again and you see how far I've gone through the whole process. You've told me once. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Okay, great. Uh, Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. It's on time and it looks very good. Oh. Here you go. Charles, how are you? Oh. 
Thank you. I got it. Thank you much. He also advises students to consider time for task accomplishment. Slow down. Margaret. Yes. We already have to submit our assignments. And when was that due? Two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm not able to accept it. It's very clear in the syllabus when the assignments were due. And I have given many reminders in class. We have I have even spoken program. with you two individually. Yes, but you know. I'm trying to teach you responsibility and time management, planning ahead. That's why I give reminders. That's why I have you do rough drafts of your paper. That's why I give you a syllabus, okay? So unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to accept this paper. And you're gonna have to get a zero in continuous assessment. Because no, this is the only way that you're gonna learn responsibility, is if you have to deal with consequences. It's not fair to your classmates who have submitted this at time. Dr. Bulanda's magnanimity does not only stop there. He happened to be the first in the Department of Social Work to collaborate with the American Embassy to provide scholarships for students in the department to further study in the United States. As other Fulbright scholars that have experienced, he has gone beyond the call of duty. Please allow me to succinctly list most of the activities or some of the activities that he has undertaken. Whereas he's here, he has set up a scholarship for two students who would have dropped out from uh, the social work department because they are not, their parents are not able to pay. He provided full two-year scholarship for them and now they are doing very well in the program. This was the last examination conducted by Dr. Bulanda in Fura Bay College. If you must, I underline the word must be up. If you've not done that, do that now. I would not want any noise from anybody's cell. For time, I'll be guiding you as to the time. So you don't have problems with that. So all cell phones must be up. That's the one. In his special lecture conducted for students of the social work department, he advised them to see the codes and ethics of the social work profession as a guiding tool in the field. So, class, I just wanted to remind you that um, you must go out into the field to do your volunteer project. 
and you know we talked about the importance of going out in the field for a number of reasons. First of all, you're learning all of these skills and techniques and theories about helping people, but it's really important for you to be able to put it into practice. Um, second, you have an ethical obligation, even as a social work student, to be improving the lives of individuals within your community, even though you're not a formal um, uh, social worker yet. It's built into our code of ethics that we must do pro bono work, work for free, volunteerism, um, regardless of, um, of what we're doing with our job. Um, and then finally, it's very important just for your professional development and to develop your CV to be able to add a volunteer work experience so that, um, so that you look more attractive to employers after you graduate. So with that being said, today we're just going to have an open discussion. Any questions that you have regarding the field of social work, um, going out and working and helping people, situations that you've encountered before. So it's just an open discussion. Confidentiality as one, one of the ethics of social work. But should in case you face a situation we are in a uh, client, you understand, comes or bumps into your office and then explains his or a problem to your life. He has contacted, he or she has contacted HIV. And then the client tells you, my social worker, I don't want you to tell anybody that I have HIV and I don't even think I would like to go for treatment. But for the fact that confidentiality as one ethics of the social work and, and, and profession <coughs> permits you not to disclose any something like that. But don't you think there is an ex exception to that that when the client's problem or illness is a danger to himself, a threat to himself and others as well, don't you think such case, confidentiality must not reveal. So when we talk about confidentiality, we have to look at it from two frameworks. First is a legal framework, and then the second is ethical. Okay, so the first thing you want to look at is, are there any legal statutes that say you must disclose this information if it's given to you? You know, like in most countries, if somebody discloses that they want to commit suicide, then you're legally responsible to share that information. Um, I don't believe that in Sierra Leone that there's any legal statutes that would um, require you to break this particular example of confidentiality. So then you go to the ethical standpoint. So this is where it becomes more difficult to make the determination. Um, you have to decide, you have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages, and ultimately what we're looking for is what is in the best interest of the client. So in the case that you're given, on the one hand the client is saying, I have HIV but I don't want you to tell anybody and I don't want to get treatment. Um, so the ethical conflict is his self-determination. Okay, self-determination is the client's ability to make his, his or her own decisions. And then the other value or ethic we have as social workers is protecting our clients, the respect of human life. Now, in this particular situation, I would say if a client is saying they don't want medical treatment, then you can't force somebody to have medical treatment. You know, so we work with clients who sometimes do destructive things to their health. We work with clients who we know after our session they're gonna go have cocaine. And we can't call the police and say, this client's gonna go have cocaine. So I would say you want to ultimately use your relationship with that client to help them to see the value in seeking treatment for themselves. Um, versus if you go violate confidentiality, then that's likely going to damage 
the relationship with the client, and you're not likely to have a positive outcome from that anyway, because nobody is going to force him or her to, to take HIV treatment. But a question I'd like to ask the class is going off of this example, where the, I'm going to draw and oppose another ethical dilemma and see what you would think about this. Let's say this man discloses he has HIV, and he has a wife, but his wife doesn't know that he has HIV. Are you ethically responsible to tell his wife? Because this is putting her safety in danger. Um, I have a question about the people that are out there. What is the social worker that sends the guidelines from Canada to work with them? Do we, because it is not safe even for the nurses, and social worker is not to come to order, is not to control them. How are we going to work with them when it is not a protective environment, a safe zone for us? Do we have to risk our own lives to work at the Ebola Center? <laughs> That's an interesting question. You know, there's, ultimately it's your, it's your choice, right? I mean, nobody's gonna force you to go to work with and, you know, a, a patient who has Ebola. Um, now, if you're a medical social worker, then you're kind of, you're making that choice of, of being willing to put yourself at risk. You know, it's, um, there's certain part, there's certain potential dangers that you put yourself into as a social worker. You know, as I told you guys before, in the school that I worked at, the, the kids had serious emotional problems, so I've been bit, kicked, headbutted, you name it, attacked. Um, I've, you know, come home with bruises before, bite marks on my arms. I knew going into work every day that there was potential danger, but I chose to go there. I also knew that a lot of the the teenagers that I was working with were involved in gangs. So sometimes I did things that made them mad. So sometimes they would threaten to come after and kill me or to you know break into my car or whatnot. So those are all dangers that I made the choice to, you know, what we call them work hazards. You know, just like if you're in construction, it's possible you're going to fall off a building or, you know, cement's going to, cement block's going to fall on your head. Those are work hazards. So you have to decide what work hazards are you willing to take. You know, some people are uncomfortable with, for example, um, doing home visits because home visits can be dangerous, especially for a woman. You know, like you, you know, if you're, you know, Mabel's going to a home by herself. What if the, you know, the father is, has an alcohol problem, he's alone, and there's no neighbors in the area? That could be a potentially dangerous situation for her. So she has to decide if she wants to be, to take a job where she's going to do home visits. So similarly, if you're choosing to be a medical social worker, then you're going to put yourself at risk for for getting diseases. That's 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 one of the work hazards. But when it comes down to it, is you make that choice. If are are those the risks that I'm willing to take for my job? Okay, done. So, yeah. Yes, uh, considering the numerous problem you see in the social worker going to face in society. So let me say, if you are you are a social worker, you are facing this problem and you work with people who are not compliant, how will you cope? And you are new in the job. So you know the the first thing that's important to realize is that you're not going to be able to help everybody. Okay, you give your one hundred percent to help everybody, but you can't. You you you're not going to help all of your clients, unfortunately. You know, I mean, it's very, very hard and it's heartbreaking. I've had clients, you know, young boys, 13, 14, who were shot. You know, I read about them in the news or I look at the, you know, who's been arrested and I see the names of former clients. It's heartbreaking. Part of me is thinking, like, what could I have done differently? You know, I remember when I left being a school social worker to, um, to, to becoming a professor, 
this one boy, he was 12 when I left, he was very, very attached to me and had a very traumatic background. And we had worked together for three years and he was devastated when I left. And then eight months later, he was shot in the streets of sh Chicago, killed. And so, you know, I like didn't sleep that night. I was thinking, blaming myself, <laughs> thinking, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, even though, I mean, even though I knew he was, he was involved in these gang activities while we were still working together. And it's very possible this would have happened if we were still working together because the family was dysfunctional. So you, so you have to give your 100%, but if somebody is that resistant to change, then you, you always let them know you're available when, when they're ready to make the change, you check in with them. But realistically, you know, the jobs that you're gonna get, they're gonna have, you're, they're gonna be very few social workers and you're gonna have a lot of clients. So there's, um, there's a saying, are you guys familiar with the squeaky wheel gets the oil? <laughs> okay, so meaning like if you're pushing a cart and there's one one wheel that's making the noise, that's the one that's gonna get the oil. So this is a metaphor for when you're working with clients and let's say you have 50 people on your caseload, but you only have 40 hours to do work, you're not gonna be able to meet with 50 people. So What's, what's going to happen sometimes is the squeaky wheel is going to get the oil, meaning the client who's coming, who's showing attention, or you know, who, who's seeking help is going to come, or the clients who are in the most critical situation, the ones that are suicidal or homicidal. You know, I mean, the, it's the same thing even with me being a teacher here. The students that come, that ask me about ex the exam questions, that come, ask me to help them with their writing, they got extra support. I couldn't necessarily reach out to everybody else who wasn't asking for that help you know so so that's one way of kind of managing the, the difficulties unfortunately those clients that are ambivalent about about change need a lot of attention and a lot of times we don't have the time to give them that attention and there needs to be um, special program you know then we need to advocate for special programs to, to help those clients <coughs> Students of the Department of Social Work, Fura Bay College, expressed their various views on how Dr. Jeffrey Bolanda has greatly impacted their academic struggle as well as other aspects of their life. Um, I was very fortunate to be lectured by Dr. Bolanda with three models, and the presence of Dr. B. House as a complete turning point in the Department of Social Work. He was like a mentor, he was not only a teacher, he was patient with us, he understood us, he was tolerant, like even when we were having problems with our studies and like things we were trying to understand, he, he could explain it to in depth, he always had time to like see us, he always had time to, to like talk to us and like go through our work step by step. Well, if I can explain what I know about him is that Dr. Jeff is one of the best lecturers, as I just mentioned earlier. And it gives us uh, advice, courage, and the positive of our profession, which I believe is very good. And I hardly receive it from any other lecturer in the department. Especially when it comes to uh, making sure that students are committed. You know, um, what I admired about him was, um, you know, because we are used to a system where um, people come, you know, to classes late. You know, and when he came, you know, people no longer come to classes late, people come on time, you know, everybody wants to be part of his class, you know, and which was really, really inspiring. Shao Khan once said, experience is a good teacher, and I strongly believe that Dr. B has a wealth of experience in the field of social work, and is well determined, committed, and motivated to impact in knowledge, especially in young people coming back. Dr. B is exactly that kind of lecturer who puts himself in the place of those who find learning hard. His theories, ideologies, teachings are well structured and pragmatic. They are evident in, ev in everyday life. Dr. Jeff was my lecturer. He's a very good man. He's a very punctual lecturer. He's always on time. Those are good qualities I like about him. He taught me how to write and be bold enough in class to talk in public and do things that I have not been able to do in the past. He was like 
he was like a, a father, like a mentor to all of us in the class. Now, um, on a scale of one to ten, if I should rate Dr. B, if I was asked to rate him, I would rate him a ten, a ten over ten, if possible, eleven, because he completes every part of the criteria that requires you to be like a teacher. He he is he fills in every gap. He's he's patient. He's understanding. He's firm. Obviously, like when he's supposed to do your work, he's supposed to turn it in time. But he is also understanding and gives you leniency when you don't meet up to like the criteria and he always encourages you to like be the best that you can be he was like one of the best lecturers in this campus in Faraday College but for me um, I really think um, Doc was very inspirational inspirational in the sense that um, I just he's like a role model I actually want to be like him um, be a workaholic because that was what exactly he was, you know, he was actually a To say, one thing I admire most about Dr. B is that he always has time for people. He always has time to encourage us to be good people in society. And he always finds time to, to make the class interesting. After a long, boring lecture, he finds he brings in things that will make us laugh, to just feel warm and encouraging to learn in the class. As Dr. Bulanda believes that education is one of the measures to build human potential in society, he came across the Declarus School and soon started donating stationery to this institute. Soon after that, the proprietor told the doctor that he and his wife, based on the feedback from the students, wanted to rename the school after him, the Jeffrey Bolanda International Academy. He was honored, shocked, and then a little uncomfortable at first with the school being named after him. But he would not take no for an answer. Dr. Bolanda couldn't be more proud of the mission. A free school specifically targeting kids not in school and engaged in child labor, though they have lots of work ahead. Dr. Bulanda recognized that there is a great need for children to be empowered. He therefore set up a youth empowerment group called the Pikimpadi Network, located in Adonkia Village in the Western Rural District of Sierra Leone, West Africa. The mission of this group is to promote quality education for boys as well as girls to stop child labor and violence and to also help the community be a better place. The vision is to have a peaceful civil union wherein children are set free from child labor and abuse and are able to go to school as they are the future leaders. He encourages boys in the Adonkia community who are very talented in football to keep up their commitments and good spirit for the sport. The football club was also named after him as Jeff FC. He always had extra time for students who were slow learners in class. He always had time to extra time to talk to students at office hours. You know, he always motivated us. And he, you know, at some point I was always like, I was, I was. I was not a good writer, but Dr. Jeffrey Bolanda has contributed a lot in my life because as I'm talking now, I can write a very good paper, you know, that's because of him. And he's, he's one, there's one special thing about Dr. Jeffrey that I like, and that I like so much, is that he is down to earth. He's one man that doesn't concern about his profession, you know, he always tells students to call him by his name, you can call me Jeff, you know, he's down to earth, he likes to students he has helped us to develop a special or a new perspective in our course he has enabled us to identify our strengths and weaknesses and also cultivate our admiration and love for the profession one thing i admire about him is uh, his relentless effort in helping students with their difficulties their assignments whatever they need he is always there to respond to he has always been responsive and then 
Another thing is he hardly gets I mean, tired or angry in terms of um, um, dealing with the students, especially when the questions are asked. He always has ways and means of dealing with different problems. He had also been able to assess our psychological, emotional and social problems during our classes and that makes class very effective. He has all, all very good strategies of uh, passing on his knowledge, his teaching techniques are very good, accommodating, encouraging, and above all, he's a um, very disciplined person. What I like about Dr. Jack is commitment is very committed, he never misses class, he's always on time, and he uh, has a very powerful way of letting the girls to them, that is also understanding his. Dr. Blania is one professor who helped us to imbibe certain disciplines, especially in relation to time. Because when you look at where he was living, away from um, the distance of his, from his residence to the campus there, almost he was one of the, the people that was living in the farthest distance away from the campus. And nevertheless, he was always, always the first in the class before every student. From a personal perspective, Paul, oh, I don't know how to say it, but he has inspired me a lot. Firstly, I was a person that had been in the shadows in my own problems. But he kind of gave me a new insight to look to view my own problems, to look into my own problems. And kind of motivate, motivated me by giving me tools in which I now move do things for the intrinsic factors rather than extrinsic factors. And so, now, I'm so proud to say that because of his inspiration and passionate thoughts and wordings, I can now work on my own problems, my lapses, and probe for the future. Um, Dr. Vilanda is, um, is a very interesting man, very hard worker. He became a role model and a mentor to a lot of us. He, um, he wasn't just only a lecturer, he was more like a teacher, a father, he's patient, he's kind, he's compassionate. He is so dedicated to his work and it's really one of the um, characteristics of him that I like. He's, um, if I'm to say something about his personality, I would say he's a very determined and very focused lecturer. He knows this stuff and he knows how to pass this stuff to his students. Dr. Jeff is just an example of a role model. He is my mentor. All what he has taught us and me in particular, I will leave to remember to the my dying days. And he told me that I go beat you, so stop me saying I go beat you, I go beat you, I have internalize it and I will always work with it. And one of the things that I admire most about this dog is, is that whenever you are saying something, even though it's not right, he will just say yes, mm, right, no, I have internalized that also and I will only practice. I will give a helping hand to whoever I meet along the way. So um, there were a number of challenges that um, I faced in coming here. You know, the first was the only contact person I had in Sierra Leone was Dr. Jarrett who wrote me the letter of invitation to come here. So I had never been to Sierra Leone. I didn't know where I was going to live. Um, I didn't know who was going to teach me how to get around. Um, luckily, I was able to connect with um, the executive director of a human rights organization here, and he helped me find a place to, to stay, as well as in the beginning really showed me around teaching me how to use the transportation and so forth. Since I've been here, um, you know, there are a number of daily challenges. Uh, I, I, I made a concerted effort to to try to live like the average Sierra Leonean. So, um, you know, a lot of other Fulbrighters, for example, stayed in guest houses while they were here or hired a driver to drive them around. Um, and so I wanted to make an effort of, you know, taking the public transportation with everybody. For example, um, living in a, a village with Sierra Leoneans. So I really knew my neighbors. Um, you know, every day is a challenge with transportation in terms of it's uncomfortable fighting, pushing people um, in order to get on the transportation um, and so forth. Um, in terms of teaching, a number of challenges including there's no classrooms designated for the classes, so sometimes 
I get into conflicts with other lecturers who want to use the same classroom as me. Um, very limited um, teaching um, materials such as projectors, computers to be able to use. Um, the students don't have access to textbooks. So I've had to completely change my typical style of cheating, not cheating, of teaching, to, um, to accommodate the challenges that I encounter here in Sierra Leone. Um, and I think the other big challenge I face is just kind of the emotional wear and tear that this trip has taken. You know, it's very difficult for me to um, go into my apartment knowing that I'll have a full breakfast and dinner and then the and then my neighbors are you know living on maybe 1,000 leones a day to eat which is equivalent to 25 cents um, so I certainly experience a lot of guilt um, in terms of the privileges I have when I'm living so close to you know so many disadvantaged individuals um, as well as just hearing the stories from the, the kids, the adults in the neighborhood, the youth in my um, youth program, my students at the university, hearing their, the stories of the traumatic experiences they've been through. Um, it's been very difficult and I've had to find my own um, support system here as well as looking at my support system back in the U.S. to help me to, um, to manage all these different feelings I encounter. So B was my lecturer, he's a caring person, he's nice, he's time bound, he respects his time, he respects his students, he's really a great guy, he shows us a lot of stuff. Well, actually, if you guys ask me about my experience about um, Dr. Jeff, though Dr. Jeff did not teach me, what I would like to say, Dr. Jeff is a very nice lecturer. I could still remember when I just entered year one in the Department of Social Work because some of us who entered in this, uh, in this university, many people did not know what is social work. But Dr. Jeff called for a meeting. He tried to synthesize us, telling us the importance of social work. How, if you graduate as a social worker, what impact would you have in your life? Though social work is a very new course in the university here at Flabi College per se, many students did not understand the role of a social worker, what social work is all about. Through the help of Dr. Jeff, he explained to us and tell us the importance of social work. So going back, um, it's very, very difficult. This is the har it's certainly the hardest termination I've had um, experienced in my career. I had actually applied to stay here for another year, um, and when I got the notice that, that my request wasn't accepted, that was actually the first time that I cried in Sierra Leone. Um, it was just, uh, I had it in my mind that, you know, I've done everything it would take to, to build another year, or to have another year here, and um, I had already planned my second year, and then that just kind, kind of came crashing down. And so that was probably the hardest single moment I've had in Sierra Leone. We are definitely going to miss you, and we hope to see you very soon. Um, I'm gonna really, really miss Dr. Bilal. I miss his, um, his little jokes in class, his story, um, his accent, uh, when he tries to pronounce African words. Um, I wish him all the best, and I hope he comes back soon. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. As if a movie once said, a good teacher who can take a zero pin to help kids develop physically, socially, emotionally is literally an angel. There's one thing I admire most about Dr. Lee is that he is that type of person who is very motivating, inspiring, expected of a good lecturer. As Maggie Malaga once said, of all the hard jobs around, the hardest is being a good teacher. So therefore, I want to commend Dr. B for being a good teacher and I thank him for giving me knowledge that I think nobody can take away from me. I missed you. I missed you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Your memory will always be there. I thank you. Dr. Jeff, you're a role model in my life. I will, never, I will always leave to remember you. I thank you. Now, I just want to say I would really miss Dr. Bielanda and I really want to see him again. I can't wait to see him again. I'll always keep in touch with you.
bittersweet you know on the one hand um, um, I miss my friends families some of the comforts of the US um, and so I'm excited to see them um, and I'm also very excited because I know this isn't going to be my last time in Sierra Leone um, I just got a community-based organization registered um, that I'm the executive director of uh, it's the, the proprietors of a school in my village we named the school after me um, and I'm going to be continuing to have plenty of contact with my students here um, at 4AV College. So um, those are the good aspects. In terms of going back, um, I, I, I would probably use, if I had to um, sum it up in one word, I would say worry, you know, because I'm very worried about um, my college students. Uh, you know, who's going to teach them how to write, who's going to make sure they get internships, who's going to help them with their dissertations. All of those thoughts frequently come across my mind. Similarly, I have a youth program um, in the village I stay at, and so I worry about those youth that I'm, um, I'm leaving. Um, I'm not going to be able, I've been paying their full school fees, and I'm not going to be able to pay their entire school fees next year. So I worry about whether or not their families will be able to contribute. I worry um, whether or not they'll be as on top of their studies as they are now because I'm monitoring them. Um, so, so it's definitely a lot of mixed, very strong feelings that I'm having as I'm, I'm, as I'm getting ready to go. Hi, Uncle Jay. Hey, that's my man. So how was school today? Fine. Uncle Jay, you know what? No. We learned something new. What is it? It's called the alphabet of life. Hmm, I've never heard about that one before. So can you please tell me what it sounds like? Now listen. Mm. Avoid ghetto, avoid gamble, avoid all the funny things that we will lead you to trouble. Mm. Be careful, money, take life suffer, smoking, drinking, my friend, all I'm full. Mm. Concentrate on your schoolwork, try to be the best you can, may I wish you good luck. D. Don't you ever steal for no reason, if you disrespect the law, you gonna end up prison. Mm. Every day make sure you pray, ask the Lord to show you the way. Mm. Friendship, not a living thing. Make sure you respect your company, your mommy. Good things come to those who wait. You get for work and they concentrate. H. Health is wealth and no to sex. If you can't, I suggest you use your rest. Thank you for my position.
of Dr. Jeffrey Bulanda's academic might, students considered him as an academic mentor. He thereby came up with a slogan to represent what he stands for. On Wednesday, the 9th of July, 2014, Dr. Jeffrey Bulanda finally left the shore of Sierra Leone. No more, children, don't you cry no more. Thank you for thanking me. Okay. Kings and queens of Africa, avoid bad word. Don't forget the fear of God. F. Lightning is better than silver and gold. If you want to be a star, you get from the bone. Make day while the sun shine. You never know, tomorrow, not gonna be fine. Hey. Net, not so for play ball on the street light. Now they tell that if you don't, they only book time. Oh. Opportunity comes but once. Time and time not for no man, I hope you understand. Hey. Prostitution and abortion, stay off. Focus on education. Q. Question should be answered. Pay attention at class, you know, go there for cameras. Ah. Respect elders, respect to parents. Whether they reach your pool, take a sin, they still go to go. Thank you. Say no to club, say no to bad body, listen to mommy and daddy. See. The street get it, it's not a secret. If you really want to succeed, avoid the street. You, you can be where you wanna be. If you walk out, believe me, you self go see. see. Violence not a pain. I don't be say you for fetch, you come the world, I only play. W. Walk out, study hard, avoid that guy the way they play trick hard. X mask come once in a year. Go ahead and celebrate. Everybody should be late. Why? You should go to church every Sunday. You should go to mosque every Friday. I said. See back us not for mago mago. See my parents. Say they say, Paddy can't go. Thank you. Special shout out when they go to all the one that the feds for push making business go be fun at the country. Especially the NGOs them, huge groups them, all the big organizations there as well. How about the picking organizations them, like picking business, Children's Forum Network, Kids Radio, Voice of the Children, School for the Blind, Great Children of Africa. Golden Kids, Young Potentials, Children Advocacy Production, Keep Up The Good Work, To Individuals Them Like, Mama T, Sky Vida, Fraud, Daffiji and Lizzie Ride, How About My Man, Hassan, <laughs> I owe you for this one, The Alphabet Of Life Yo, I'm out. <laughs>